Welcome back to Arrows Next Door. Thank you all for joining us today. We are in Delaware. We're doing the American Legion Ambulance Station, and we're going to be doing a station rigs on their ambulance. So let's go see what they have. So today we're meeting up with Jason. He's the assistant director here. He's going to walk us through the truck and tell us all about how they set this thing up and what it's all about. So here we have a 2024 E450 on a gas chassis built by PL Custom. Uh, we have we currently have four of these ambulances in the fleet. Uh, the oldest one being five years old to the newest one. Uh, starting around the outside, just a standard oxygen compartment. This is where all the oxygen is stored for the main supply on the unit. Now I noticed on that you have actually a way to get that in and out of the trucks. When I work on the truck, I have to kind of pick that thing up. Yeah, we've evolved over the years. Uh, back injuries are, are very prone for EMS workers. So having this uh, lift system, it actually will bring it down out of the truck and bring it back into the truck. Could you show me how that works? Absolutely. Got to turn it on to get it done? Yeah. All right. Just reach and unlocks that. So a safety lock. Holy cow, that makes it easy. <laughs> Because each of those, when they're full, are weighing probably about 75 to 100 pounds, right? Right, yeah. So this way we can safely secure it with the straps in case we're in a any sort of accidents. It keeps it secure and make sure it doesn't become a missile if ever involved in an accident. Right. And again, with an easy push of a button, we can load it back in. doesn't hurt our backs. My back feels much better watching this do all the work. You know, I've been doing this for about 31 years, and the things that they've come up with with power, putting those in, and even the power stretchers make a real big difference. It's probably put, you know, another 10 years on my servers before I have to retire. Absolutely. What do you have up front, Jason? Can you kind of walk us through what's in the front of the cab here? In the front of the cab, you just find a normal driver's seat like inside a car. And then in the center console is all the switches for the radios and the lights. I noticed that you don't have any kind of MDC or anything, computers up front like I've seen in the past. How do you guys get dispatched? So we're dispatched through the radio system and then there's a tablet in the back of the unit that the call will actually pop up on. Okay. It, it stays in the back for charging because they use it for checkout purposes, uh, PCRs with the patients, and then um, for uh, any report documenting. Um, and then also we get the uh, notification through our phones that'll give us the CAD information okay. as we're heading to the call. Okay, so that gets rid of the laptops that they have in the yeah. trucks by using tablets and phones. Correct. Okay, as we work our way around to the back of the ambulance, we're going to work our way all the way through, if you don't mind, yeah. and just kind of show us what's in each of the doors. So in this compartment, it's pretty much like a maintenance compartment. It keeps our fire extinguisher, our safety triangles, in case we uh, are, on, are involved in a mechanical incident and we need to shield traffic from us. These red book bags carry our extra BSI gear during COVID with our extra uh, gowns and uh, PPE that we carry. That's in them red bags. Okay. And then just some fire extinguisher, or I'm sorry, um, jumper, cables. jumper cables and then a tool kit. Okay. I also noticed that you have old school backboard for a short board for doing CPR. Yep. And you actually have some fire tools, which you have a halogen in there. Mm -hmm. Why would an EMS service need a halogen? So or when we get a car cool again or whatever not, we call it. <laughs> not all the time is the fire department on scene with us uh, to if we need to gain entry into a residence, if somebody Dials 911 is unable to unlock the door, we can make forcible entry by using these tools to gain access to them. Okay. So it just helps with the delay, no delay in time. Right. Okay. <laughs> I love the little logo you guys got, the little road runner. So we originally came up with that about 25 years ago. Uh, it's made different forms, but for, as far as the road runner, because he's always running. Yeah. Very busy EMS service. So every ambulance has the road runner on it. So in this compartment, uh, we can hang our ballistic vests. All the crews are equipped with a ballistic vest okay. for any sort of police actions. Uh, right here, our district has a lot of water. We have the shoreline, so we have uh, flotation devices. Something you don't see on many departments here is our DEMA bag. Our first due ha is in the area for danger if anything were to happen at the nuclear power plant. Okay. So we have what has a radiation detectors and whatnot if we ever have to respond into the to danger zone. Wow, okay. Yeah, that's definitely something you don't see on every ambulance. And the fact that you guys have hangers to put your vests uh, is a very cool idea, so you don't have to wear them all day long right. every time. 
And then just a normal cooler uh, with water and Gatorade for not only our crews, but if we go on the fire scenes or different extended operations, keeps everybody hydrated when we do rehab at different scenes. And then a tarp for larger people. It's reinforced with webbing. Uh, if we need to move somebody, uh, it's obese. Right, so that's a heavy mover kind of thing. Yeah. Moving yeah. our way around. Okay. Just a snapshot into the back of the ambulance as we'll, we'll climb in in a second. Okay. You can see the striker stretcher that is on a power load system. Again, using the mechanical advantage, help saves our backs. Very nice. So we had an opportunity to take a look at an ambulance at Minkwitz Fire Company a couple of years back, and they have the power load system. Mm -hmm. That at the time was about a 700 pound weight that you could put on that. Is, yes. about what, is that what they're still running? We are at 750 pounds with this particular model. Okay, okay. And for the price of a small car, it's worth every bit. <laughs> and all you're doing is just pushing a button. With the push of a button, one finger. And it goes right up. And then just slowly ease it into the... Makes a real big difference when you're trying to load those patients in there. And it gives more safety. Uh, the ambulance of the past will have a securing bracket in the front where the wheels will lock in and then a bar on the side that it will lock where this one has double locking, where it's locking at the head and at the feet okay. into that center beam. Very cool. Get that open. All right, working our way around. And this compartment is for mobilization. So we have our backboards, we have a reef stretcher, and then a scoop stretcher. Uh, scoop stretcher doesn't has been a, a probably a thing that a lot of BLS providers forget about. We tend to push it as much as we can um, it's, it can be something that's forgotten about a lot. So we really push it a lot in our department for whether you're moving the elderly with hips, hip injuries or things like that, a lot easier to cradle them and then get them onto a softer stretcher. Okay, and how, what do you mean by that? How do you cradle them? Is it just design different or what happens with it? So here it actually has two connections on, or I'm sorry, a connection on each end okay. and they'll actually come apart oh, and you wow. can scoop the patient up without having to lift or be able to better lift them. Okay. Um, it extends to different sizes so you can fit every every size that we may encounter. So instead of rolling a patient from side to side, you're able to come in from either side and kind of scoop them right. up. Yep. Hence the name. Scoop. Okay. That's a pretty slick device. And then going along with the backboards, we have C collars. Uh, for immobilization, we would put this around an individual's uh, neck to kind of keep their C-spine uh, without restrict the movement to further any injuries if they were to have any. So we keep a... a Various different sizes yes. of adjustable yes. collars. Yeah. And the yellow thing down below is a stair chair, is that correct? Yep, so it's a, a chair with some wheels, or actually rollers on it. That way we can put somebody, if they're upstairs or downstairs, they can be sec safely secured into here and it has tracks that'll actually allow us to roll down the steps safely without having to put strain on our backs or compromise safety for the patient be able to smoothly lower them down. Right. That's pretty slick to have because now you're just kind of rolling down the stairs rather than carrying somebody. Yeah, and having each step and everybody's being jolted on each step, this is able to slowly go down and it's tightened to slow with the friction to slow the chair going down so you're not just sliding down the steps. Okay. So it kind of carries some of the weight. Moving this compartment is more our CPR stuff, um, our AED, okay. our suction unit, and then our Lucas device. Can you explain to me what an AED is? Not everybody that watches the channel might not know. A lot of people do, but let's explain to them what that means. So it's automatic defibrillator. If somebody's heart stops beating, and if it happens to be in a shockable rhythm, this will deliver a shock to reset the heart into a, to bring it back to the life. Okay. The BLS provider, does that have a screen on it that you can actually see an EKG or does it all do it for you? Yeah, it does it all for you. It'll, when you put it on the patient while you're doing CPR, it'll actually analyze the rhythm and if it senses a rhythm that's shockable, it'll advise you that and you can deliver the shock to the patient. Very cool. And then you also said a Lucas device. And what is a Lucas device? So a Lucas device is a mechanical advantage CPR machine that will assist in compressions on a patient okay. in cardiac arrest. So in the years past, when we get a cardiac arrest, we'd call in the fire department and they would help do it. And we'd change them out every 
two two minutes, you know, right. if we can, if we have enough personnel, we would do that pit crew CPR. But with a Lucas, this is different. So yeah, while we're on scene, we usually we run two units on all CPRs. Um, that way, it would give us more people, and we will do uh, pit crew CPR, rotating everybody out every two minutes. Uh, to make sure we're getting a good CPR. But when, if there's a decision to transport the patient to the hospital, um, it's a lot safer going highway speeds down the road and standing up doing CPR versus you put this machine on, it'll do, it do it, this machine doesn't get tired. You don't have to switch it out every two minutes. You set it and let it go. Um, and it, it allows all of our providers to be seat belted and safely ride to the hospital while providing other inter interventions. Yeah, I mean, that, that definitely is a, a good saver, not only for our energy. Absolutely. And, you know, focus on what's going on with the patient, but the safety going down the road, mm -hmm. something that you really don't even think about. Right, yep. So I understood that this uh, company is all volunteer, or it's actually a supplement of paid and volunteer staff. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So we are probably 75% uh paid and then 25 percent volunteer okay <laughs> and then how does that work if i wanted to volunteer here and i don't have any service or I, i'm not certified mm -hmm. can i still volunteer absolutely so we have many positions uh whether it be administrative or on the operation side as far as riding the ambulance uh we would send you through this the training um to get your certifications and then we actually have a program that would train you on the job training through a fto process field training process um, that will bring you up to meet the expectations of the department and the protocols set forth by local powers to be. Okay, is there an age requirement that I would have to be? Is there a certain age that I can't be? So at the age of 16, you can join our department and that's also the age for the EMT in the state of Delaware. Um, and that way they're looking at using kids that are in high school as a career path, they're able to get their EMT card and get that started so when they graduate, they can move into a, a career at EMS. Nice, okay, mm. okay. And if I wanted to get a hold of you, is there a website, is there a Facebook page, TikTok, something? So like we that? have we have a website, it is ambulance64.com or on Facebook, the American Legion Ambulance Station 64. Uh, yep. Okay, can we take a look on the inside? Absolutely. All right. Can you tell me how everything is all set up in the back of an ambulance? Absolutely, so here, this is where the patient lays on the stretcher. And this is the head, so of course their feet would be down at that end. So we kind of built the ambulance around where the patient is. So as a as a patient's here in the head, it, we would be doing more breathing treatment. So we set up all of our airway stuff here. Airway being for the breathing, whether it's oxygen masks, uh, nasal cannulas, and different adjuncts for air, securing an airway. To we have CPAP, which is a mask or an, a mask that will push oxygen into the lungs. Okay. And then different airway adjuncts and uh, so you got like nasal tubes, you have oral um, blocks. So, yeah, so we have different sets of, of airways, whether it be the nasal airways or the oral airways. Here we have our suction unit. So if a patient has something uh, stuck in their throat, whether it be if they vomited or if a traumatic injury and they have teeth or mucus and all that stuff in their mouth, we can use this suction here and we we'll use different uh, tools to be able to clear the airway and it'll put it into this clear canister. So we can just kind of see what we're bringing out of the, okay. the airway and continue to monitor. If we can't get it with this particular one, we have different, uh, different suction catheters. Okay. That way a different, because everybody's a different size. And it looks like one is hard, but some are soft. Yes. Okay. Yep. And then obviously to your left, my right, mm -hmm. is the inside outside cabinet because I kind of yep. see the Lucas through the door yep. and that's where your AED is. Yep. So the only a couple of things in here that we couldn't see from the outside. Uh, the purple bag is for kids. So all of our pediatric stuff, whether it be the, the oxygen tubing, uh, the airways for um, this pediatric sizes, it has everything that our bag for adults has except all the pediatric sizes. Uh, the orange bag at the bottom, that is a trauma bag. So our units are staffed with two EMTs. So if we go to a car accident and there's more than one patient, one the uh, EMT on the truck will go to one of the patients and the other EMT can go to another patient utilizing that orange bag there and they can split off and treat double patients at the same time. Okay. And above that are your, all your different size gloves. Yep. And here is our fancy book bag, first in bag. Okay. Uh, this carries a little bit of everything that we have inside the unit. Um, that way, when we go into inside, inside someone's house or into a scene, we have all the stuff that we would need until we get them out into the ambulance and continue care. Okay. And that has oxygen and stuff in it? 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. So having the large oxygen tank, like a clipboard for our paperwork. Yeah, paperwork's always important nowadays. So along with the oxygen, we have our medications here. We have a different variety um, as far as a BLS provider. Uh, we have the aspirin that we give for chest pains um, through the, for ACS, uh, Tylenol, Zofran, Albuterol for the breathing treatments. We do uh, Duoneb, so we give the Albuterol with the Atrovent. Uh, we carry Benadryl, Narcan. Uh, we have a pediatric and an adult EpiPen for allergic reactions. And then glucose for if someone's blood sugar is too low, we can give them the tubes of oral glucose to help bring that up. Okay, one of the questions I have for you is, it sounds like with those kind of medications, you're more equivalent to an EMTI or an intermediate than just a standard BLS because you can give the breathing treatment, or is your state different? Our state's different. We um, we started out butyrol probably five years ago, and just this past year we uh, introduced the Atrovent into it to get, make it the Duoneb. We do not do any intravenous drugs, um, no IVs, no cardiac monitoring. That's more of the EMTI stuff. Okay. And our state does not recognize that. Okay, so you're in your state of Delaware, you have ALS versus BLS only? Correct. Okay. And then uh, what else is in there? You got the clipboard, you got, it looks like a pulse oximetry. You're Here we have a RAD57. So this is doubles as a pulse oximeter and a, uh, it reads the CO levels. So that way, if anybody, carbon dioxide, if they are- Coming out of a fire or something like that. Right, any sort of leaks or anything in their house, we can test that um, with this simple device. A glucometer that we can check people's blood sugar. Anytime they're not really acting right and if they're a diabetic or even if they're just not acting right, the brain runs off of sugar and oxygen. So again, if we could check the, sh uh, the oxygen, then we can check the sugar and kind of go from there and work through our algorithm of AEIU tips, kind of figure out why they're not acting appropriately. Right. So you're starting to narrow down those differential diagnoses right. that we talk about as ALS providers. That's pretty cool to see. Now I noticed you got a, a, a unique tool there. It's got, it looks like a little W uh, yeah. and those are for what? So this is for unconscious patients um that it's pretty much a set of uh restraints or what you would consider something similar to handcuffs if somebody is unresponsive and unable to keep their hands up on their belly uh when we're moving them in around we don't want to bang their elbows or their hands up and get caught in between things and get pinched their hands so this will actually their wrists will slide into here this uh, elastic band will keep them secure to help keep that way they're not dragging down and injuring the patient. That's pretty cool to see. All too often we use maybe cravats or we try to tie their hands up, right. but having a real quick, simple tool yep. like Pops that right will make on. a big difference. Yep. Some adjuncts for oxygen. If we were given that breathing treatment, uh, the tools that I need are in here, the oxygen mask and then the different setups to give the nebulizer. And this side, we have our blood pressure cuffs and our stethoscope. So we can check our uh, the blood pressure. This is for the adults. Again, all of our pediatric sizes are in the pediatric bag over here. So we have an adult size and then a large adult size for people if they have a bigger bicep, if we can get around to check their blood pressure. Okay. So that was a pretty good first in bag. You pretty much can handle any emergency at that moment in time. Yeah, if we go here on the front, we also have the, the trauma st uh, stuff. So pretty much different size band-aids, whether it is a little boo-boo or a big boo-boo. Um, from our trauma uh, dressings, our splints, our tourniquets, and stuff to control bleeding and to dress wounds that we need to. And this is just to stabilize it and to get them out to the ambulance and roll on from there. Okay. And this is the bag that you would take in pretty much every call until proven otherwise. Yes. Yep. Above your head, you have some more cabinetry. So up here we have, we keep our ice packs and cold packs. We keep toys, uh, little stuffed animals for kids. Um, to kind of give them some comfort as we're taking them to the hospital. It's never a good thing for little kids to be inside of an ambulance. Uh, being with strangers gives them something a little bit comfort to keep them calm. Here's just our BSI stuff where we um, face mask, eye protection. If there's any blood, vomit, spit, body fluids that we don't want in our mouth or in our eyes, this covers um, that. And then we have the stuff to help clean up with it. Um, and then doubling, same thing on right behind you. Um, it's some more cleanup stuff our burn kits, trauma pads, our sterile water for cleaning out any wounds, uh, restraints if anybody needs to be restrained down so they're not swinging or anything. Now, can you guys deliver babies in these trucks too? We can, so we actually have a kit. So we have an OB kit here. It gives us the, all the stuff we need to basic 
to deliver the baby, whether it be sheets, um, little bulbs, uh, syringes to suction out the airway of the baby, and then uh, tools to clamp the cord and to cut it. So pretty much an ambulance is designed to do any life-threatening emergency that you could have within the first 10 minutes of an emergency. Absolutely. So we can bring life back or we can deliver life. Yep. Down here is more of our trauma stuff. More of our... Just again, all the same trauma stuff that's in the bag, just a little bit more uh, bigger of a supply. I like that it's well organized and stocked nicely. It sits right here next to the EMT. So when the patient, when they're treating the patient and they're here, it's right there at their hands. They can have it there, whether they're going to airway or they're going to the trauma, it gives them a good right here at the, at their fingertips. Same with this compartment. It's everything, the rest of the stuff in the bag for assessing on a routine transport. If you're doing, whether it's a blood pressure, checking their oxygen or checking their uh, blood sugar, we keep it right here. That way that bag can be secured and we're not getting up moving around. We're able to sit in our seat belt, stay secured as we continue to transport to the hospital. About how many crew members do you have on a, a typical ambulance? So we staff two EMTs. Yep. Our department has ride-alongs, so we can um, have up to two more ride-alongs. So through the fire school or the local uh, school when they need ride-alongs, they can come on and we'll staff an additional two of those. And then again, our system here in Delaware is a two-tier system. So we'll have the paramedics, if it's an ALS call, the paramedics will also board our unit as well. So we can have up to f uh, five or six people in this uh, area at a time. Okay. Now I'm gonna kind of throw a question at you from the ALS perspective. When you guys design these ambulances, obviously this ambulance is really nice and clean, well-organized. Do you take in consideration that extra partner that you're gonna have for the ALS service and make accommodations for him, such as where a sharps container might be or a place to put their equipment. So typically we leave this side for the BLS provider with having the BLS stuff here. Um, and then for this side, <laughs> typically the ALS pro or the ALS provider is the uh, lead provider on a call that they are on as for interventions and, and running the call. So here we have the sharps container for all their sharps. They have their radios so they can communicate with the hospital to call in their reports and any controls they need for in the back of the unit to make it accessible to the paramedic or the EMT, just particularly riding in there. And then a trash can for all their traffic. And the fact that you have a nice big bench seat versus a little chair, they can put their equipment on just like your bag is. Correct, yep. Very nice. Jason, thank you so much for inviting us in. It's not too often that we actually get to get inside of an ambulance and look around and see what it's all about. Thank you so much for allowing us to do this and uh, taking your time out of your day. Absolutely. Once again, this was Heroes Next Door. Thank you all for watching. Before we end, do us a favor, hit subscribe, hit notifications, smash those like buttons, share these videos with your friends, and make some comments below. We'll see you again next week.